Blizzard is currently a solution seeker for Innovation House Australia, with experience across a wide range of areas including sales, service, technical and management. He has a passion for high performance building practices with expertise in a vast range of building products and materials. While representing manufacturers and suppliers across the North Queensland region, Rowan started seeking out like-minded professionals to set about demonstrating and making changes for better housing outcomes. I have this background in industry, having been a manufacturer's representative and worked as a manufacturer um, and have been in the construction industry. <clears throat> and I don't want to get too much into the detail of products and things and technical because that really isn't the answer. The answer as I have uh, getting into the, my later professional years is working out that the answer is actually within us as humans. We can actually uh, have a much better uh, life uh, footprint on the planet if we just calm down a little bit and look within ourselves rather than trying to find the answer elsewhere. Um, it is very common for us to be bombarded on a daily basis about the latest must have tools and gimmicks and things, um, but actually the answer might actually be right within our own uh, fingertips. So that's the premises for tonight's conversation around inv innovation starts from within. Thinking about infrastructure, um, infrastructure is pretty straightforward, right? It's houses and things. And if we are to look around the world, we'll see examples everywhere um, of what suburbia and what housing and what infrastructure is. The reason I'm concentrating on housing is that one third of our carbon emissions and an enormous portion of our world's resources are tied up in developed nations particularly, and these examples of housing. And you might think that they are vastly different than those three images there. In actual fact, the images are startling all the same that we seem to get in whatever city, country, region we are, we seem to think we get an answer and then we repeat that ad infinitum. So there's no variety. These towers are just enormous towers. You don't, I don't know how you play a game of football down the grass down here or this might be an Australian suburb where the houses are all the same um, and you wonder are we really all the same do we all need the same monoculture response if it were that way then perhaps nature perhaps nature would do that in a natural response as well and clearly, nature doesn't. On the right-hand side, there's an image of a diverse um, vegetation in a beautiful tropical jungle, perhaps. And on the left, that monoculture grass is really not how nature thrives or survives. <clears throat> Having recently done some uh, research on the advent of lawn and grass, it came around with royalty and nobility wanting to show off their uh, lavish uh, manpower they had available at their fingertips and the resources to water and to uh, nurture these fields of uh, a single grass type. So to the point that they had all sorts of crazy uh, philosophies about don't walk on the grass. Um, and, you know, it's, it was a, a very weird sort of reflection or uh, over the top reflection of their wealth and uh, resource ability. And we see some of those, and this is hundreds of years ago that that started, we still see that today. We'll go and visit a, a posh school and be told that we can visit the school, but we must not walk on the grass. And it doesn't really serve much of a purpose. In actual fact, in nature, uh, there's very few places, even, even a quality farmer will tell you he wants some diversity in what's growing in his fields. He won't want all of it to be exactly the same species, exactly the same 47 millimetres tall, 
using exactly the same nutrient and lawn mowing regime because that's just that's crazy crazy use of resources our natural world has much more diversity and uh, variety in it and we do as humans we would uh and this is in increasingly a conversation where we say that we are a diverse group of humans we have um and we would encourage everybody's diversity to to come forward and speak up and uh, we want to include uh, different types uh, and different beliefs and values as we should i mean that's that's a perfectly reasonable um community aspiration so how is it that our homes don't have that diversity why is it that we are all clamoring for the same thing as the joneses down the street i want one just like that <clears throat> so that's uh that is uh, a culmination of um a passion as a manufacturer, I would have run around telling people that this is the perfect product, you must buy this. And everyone is, you know, this is the perfect answer for your housing needs. And clearly, that's not the case. We need a range of answers. The beauty is that with diverse answers, we have um, both expensive and inexpensive. We have light and shade, we have all these varieties that now become a bit more apparent and able to grasp than the tower block with ivory, you know, the ivory tower with marble bench tops. If that's not achievable, then maybe you could imagine something that works for you. And I think the first inhabitants of this nation of Australia had it pretty good when they had a bit of stringy bark looped over a tree uh, to offer some shade from the sun. They might have parked in a spot close to a stream and done a bit of fishing and a bit of camping. And that's all right by me too. So diversity uh, is maybe something that we should be having a conversation around and applying our thinking to rather than insisting that we have all the same housing outcome. And perhaps <clears throat> we can sit back and say, well, it's just not my fault. It's those big corporations. They do it. And of course, we could point to 85% of the world's media is owned by a one corporation, uh, perhaps, um, or 97% of all stats are completely made up. Um, and you can also look at our housing, uh, particularly in Australia, some examples, that there are major players who clearly have a dominant position in the marketplace. And even if that is the case, they still offer a range of outcomes and we still have a choice to accept a range of outcomes rather than insist on the one just like the Joneses down the street. And in actual fact, as consumers, don't we govern these big corporations? The devices that we must have, the um, branded clothing. Uh, Eleanor put it very well in her conversation that as a consumer, we are part of this process and we have to uh, take ownership of that part. So maybe it's big corporations and maybe it's the others are doing it. Um, I'm not sure that we can wash our hands and be completely absolved of all of the sins of an industrial world today. We have to own our own individual piece. And maybe owning our own individual piece allows us to then uh, be truly innovative in our response. So by innovative, 
it doesn't mean that it has to be the most expensive, the largest or the newest. It might be completely innovative to make do, to recycle, to repurpose. Uh, Behaviours that we have seen um, through all of our society is becoming harder and harder to find, particularly in Australia now as an example, but intergenerational living, having grandparents living under the same roof with the family, with the grandkids. Now, if you look at uh, particularly some uh, nations around the world still do this very well, but it would be quite innovative in Australia to be doing that sort of behaviour. And if we look back through history of, of, uh, of mankind, we've done this before where we've gone past eras of quite uh, developed civil engineering in the Roman era. And then after that time, we had quite... Uh, they were called the Dark Ages, where we forgot about um, citywide plumbing. And uh, we failed to maintain roads and we really dropped the ball again. So as humanity, these things ebb and flow. It is perfectly normal to see um, teenagers trying to do something different to their parents. It's probably always the history of the world. Um, and that's okay. Maybe we should stand up and own our own individual um, desires and be a bit more innovative in our own way. And maybe that comes back to the thinking about what we have today within our own reach. So when thinking about housing, um, we have lots and lots of product examples that uh, why is it today that the fridge has more computing power than the Apollo 13 that went to the moon. It just doesn't seem necessary. So maybe we could think, uh, what do we have within our fingertips today and what is reasonable and necessary? Now, of course, some people, um, Mr. Bezos might decide he needs a very big house uh, with lots of fancy stuff in it. And that's perfectly, okay for the few but maybe it's not something that we all need to aspire to <coughs> excuse me so maybe a sufficient response <clears throat> might be quite an innovative way to approach it rather than the more the larger the bigger the shinier response that we are typically sold on So out of this uh, housing background and this product background, we got to understanding that humans were always the tricky bit. We can build a beautiful house, but we have to get a person to accept the house and to like the house. And we can build a 10 star home and know that it's amazingly high performance and is good for the planet if we still have a one-star user moving into that 10-star home, we're still going to get a really poor outcome. So uh, we don't need a fridge that has got more computing power than the Apollo 13. We just need a sufficient fridge and we need a sufficient house for where our people are at. And we need our people to come along on the journey and say, hey, what would be necessary for housing? And an innovative response might actually look at something a little bit more like this. As humans, almost completely and utterly universally, everyone comes back to these core responses. I would like some personal space where I can retreat. We've seen the she shed, the man cave, the teenage retreat, all of these labels, but ultimately somewhere you can sit and reflect on your own and feel safe. Not surprisingly, that's not all. We also would like some space where we could sit and share with others. Often that then comes down to a food situation. I'd like to share a meal with others. And since the, the first kitchen 
which was just a rudimentary fire. We've always gathered around fire, a hearth, a kitchen and food to share time with other human beings. So maybe that leads to a hearth, this common place where we all sit down, tell a story. After we've finished eating, we tell bigger stories. And on Saturday night, we tell even bigger stories again. But the hearth is incredibly uh, universal amongst all people. And then perhaps some of the, you know, going really out there, we saw at the start of the pandemic where you could not buy seeds in Australia for love nor money. Everyone had decided to grow their own food. Now, I'm not sure if all those zucchinis and pumpkins survived, but they definitely were taken off the shelves and everyone responded to this primal need to go, I'm going to grow some my own food. I'd be really curious to see what sort of skill set we still have. You know, I'm pretty sure I don't have a green thumb. So maybe the message in my conversation tonight is to encourage some starting to think about innovation and sustainability. Maybe it's just as simple as sufficient to provide for my needs. Do those statements earlier, some personal space where I can retreat, some space where I could share, a hearth where we could share food together uh, and the ability to grow my own food. They're very four very, very basic needs. I'm willing to bet they probably resonate for most of you. Now that's not nearly as complex as we make our housing out to be. To deliver that, now, why aren't we chase, pursuing those sort of values rather than shiny tap? If we start thinking about those core beliefs, maybe we can stop using outdated feudal language from centuries ago, talking about titles and mortgages and tenants in common. The language is in plain sight right in front of our face. If you've ever looked at real estate and you've ever tried transacting those things, all this language comes up straight away. Our core humanity is actually much less complex than that and is much more simple. Maybe as a simple goal to reflect with your personal time, to share with others and to grow. So I have uh, blitzed through that and People Purpose Place has come off the back of our learning that it has to be a people-driven process. If we can address the human need in housing and we allow humans to find housing solutions that work for them, <clears throat> they don't have to be as complex, elaborate, expensive, resource intensive, highly technical. The responses can actually be a different way to business as usual. Of course, there will be existing business, banks and builders and developers who will do existing tower blocks and detached houses in suburbia the way that they've always done. And that business has to continue to an extent. There's a, a, a need for that and there's a market for that. But the challenge of business as usual is perhaps to start with the people and not the mechanism. If you look at the existing housing model in a developed world, the human doesn't come into provision of a house until you're looking at qualification for serviceability for the finance. The human is just not considered until it comes to a capacity question around money. Whereas if you think about the people first and turn that whole paradigm on its head, we can actually come up with a much simpler set of criteria and a much reduced demand on ourselves personally and surprisingly on the planet as a consequence. So we started this people purpose place journey as a not-for-profit entity. 
it's a very exciting journey because it is talking about this people space. And uh, I'm willing to take questions or hang around further for any comment or feedback.